Thank you, thank you, Helen. Um, you are indeed the nicest person in Canada, and I would add, and beyond. She's the nicest, period. And I'm such a lucky guy because I get to work with people like Helen in the Genius 100 community, and I'd like, before I begin with this discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the CEO of the Genius 100 community, Julie Tuscan, please be recognized, and, and the CEO and president of the Canadian Friends of the Hebrew U, Rami Kleiman, who's here. Also, please say hi to, to us. Dan, it's such a pleasure to spend time with you this afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, as you know, and I always love hearing you and your predictions and your projections for the future. But before we do that, please, we're both involved with the Genius 100 community. Tell us a little bit about what is it for you, your involvement, and, and what do you see for this, the potential of this great curated community? I spend most of my time making money and uh, helping young people start companies. I've started a few of my own. And about two, three years ago, I was in Montreal, Canada. I was meeting with the founder of Cirque du Soleil. He happened to be an astronaut too. And I was approached to join this Genius 100 Visionaries. I was a little skeptical. And I found over the last two, three years, these are my soulmates. These are people who are accomplished in life and they want to give back and they want to take the, the knowledge that they have, the resources that they have to improve the quality of life. And each and every one is just an amazing person. You know, I, I feel the same, and, and my connection to Genius 100 uh, begins with the work that I did for Israel as a brand, looking to explore the impact of Albert Einstein's vision on, especially on younger people, but on the world in general. And so how do you see the connection to Albert Einstein's legacy? Well, he was an innovator and as an, one of my hobbies is cosmology, which I was sitting in the throne room of the kingdom of space, and I had a chance to personally develop three of the four great observatories, and I also uh, did the preliminary design of the Webb Space Telescope, which is gonna look out and hopefully see the first stars that ignited after the Big Bang over 13 billion years ago. And to this day, I'm amazed by the wisdom that Albert Einstein had in making predictions. He predicted dark energy, <laughs> which is one of the biggest forces that we don't understand. And many of the things that he did were innovative. So anything associated with innovation, with improvement of the quality of life, is a good connection there. Now you served as an administrator of NASA for 10 years and you um, oversaw uh, 61 space missions at a, um, and I think that the ratio is one to 72 when, when you're looking at accidents. And you did that when, you know, every staff member, you know, came back without a scratch. To what do you attribute that amazing achievement? Well, I had 61 flights of the space shuttle and over 200 robotic missions. But I'm most proud of the fact that we launched more people into space during my tenure than any other organization or country in the world, and not one of them got a scratch. And it has to do with intensity of focus. You can't run a giant organization, multi-billion dollar organization, and want to do 25 things. You get a choice to do about three to five things, but number one was, with a probability of one in 72 that the shuttle's not gonna come back, I decided that my number one objective was safety of the human beings on the shuttle. And it drove me. I went down to almost every launch attempt. There are roughly three launches for every, three attempts for every launch, so that's a lot of times. And I went down 
to make sure when the astronauts came back from space, I'd shake their hand so they knew that I cared. It took an enormous amount of time, and people said, why are you doing it? I said, I prioritize what has to be done. Now, we got other things done, but human life is the most important thing that a leader could be responsible for. So let's talk a little bit about the future and, and about technology and how it could enhance humanity. So we don't know a lot about the future, but we know that much. We know that life expectancy is going to go up significantly. We know that most people are going to live in urban centers. Uh, we know that artificial intelligence is going to impact the job market, right? And, um, um, and how do you think this whole um, dramatic change that will occur in the next couple of decades is going to impact that social agreement that exists between governments and citizens? That how is it going to um, involve technology? I believe technology is not the issue. I believe making money is not the issue. But we're seeing the signs of stress, of lack of attention, of human-centered information systems, lack of respect for how technology is adversely impacting our planet, and a pulling away of human beings from contact with one another. As I was getting on the plane at LAX early, early in the morning yesterday, I looked around and 90% of the people weren't talking to each other. They were looking at their phones, probably for social network trivia. And what has happened is I used to look forward to flying. I'm very old and I flew long ago. I used to get on a plane and make relationships and business connections with people. We don't communicate with each other and we're getting more and more isolated. And as I listen to the presentations here, I'm not hearing the human aspect of how we integrate technology. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. But let's talk about what it's gonna look like in 2050, 30 years from now. Today, 55% 50, uh, of people on this planet live in 2% of the area, in urban areas. By 2050, that's going to go to 67%. So roughly one half the people now live in urban areas, 2% of the planet, and it's gonna be two thirds in 30 years. Now in North, and, North America and South America, there's probably 80% uh, of the people live in urban areas. So where is it gonna happen? Asia is going to absorb 2.5 billion people into the urban areas. As it is, it's impossible to get around. So first let me talk about the people, then I'll talk about the mobility. There are a number of very good things happening, but I'll come back to the dark side. Gene editing. Synthetic biology, use of artificial intelligence combined with other forms of digital information to do medical diagnostics, use of microorganisms to purify the air, to purify the waste, to generate oxygen. All these things are good. But if we don't use these tools properly, if we start wanting design of babies, not curing health problems, but I want a baby with blonde hair, blue eyes, perhaps maybe I'd like to make an army of superior people. And now I begin to cross the line. The dilemma is that legislators, for the most part, in most countries, except China, are non-technical. And they are not keeping up with what's happening technologically. So our laws, our legislations, our regulations are way out of whack. And technology is moving too fast. In fact, last night at the dinner, I heard an eloquent discussion of blockchain. There was no discussion of the impact of blockchain on humans. And I asked the question, aren't you concerned that we're building Skynet? <laughs> Don't you want to put an air gap 
in between what the machine does and put a human there and say, I want to check the machine. I got a very violent negative response. Good person, but it's indicative of what's happening when we don't pay attention to how humans relate to technology. So let, let me ask you on that. So how do you practically suggest that we do that? Because it's more than just regulation. Well, I'll give you an, anal uh, an analogy. When I was a very young person, America and Russia and France and England were exploding nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere. The clouds were carrying the radioactive material over to land. It was going into the food supply and children were dying of radiation poisoning. Individual people got together and they stopped it. <laughs> There's no discussion today. People seem disinterested in worrying about is gene editing going to transform society to the point where machines are going to control us and machines will make the future. And I'll give you an experience. I belong to a distinguished scientific club and we have some of the top biologists in the world. We have a dinner once a month and every 25 times you pay a few thousand dollars and have to give a talk. Well, during this uh, session, someone got up and said, evolution is dead, design of babies are going to happen. There was silence around the table and I freaked out. So even good scientists don't pay attention that there's responsibility as a citizen when you go to vote. It's more than just making sure money passes hands and you have a regulatory environment that's conducive to business. This is our future. And gene editing is moving. But the good news is diseases that have plagued us for centuries and millennia are gone. To be able to solve problems like people being blind and deaf, it's going to happen. And then with regards to synthetic biology, if you're not familiar with it, I could literally go to a, a laptop and I could design a genome and then I could go print it. So if a terrible viral disease breaks out and I get the genome of that disease, I could find a way of taking care of it and it could all be done almost instantly. So there's, it's the lights and shadows of technology that we have to pay attention to. I think you have a wonderful example to share with the audience of eradicating unnecessary blindness within the framework of the Genius 100 yes. community. Yes. Um, Sanduk uh, Ryut. Sanduk Ryut, I got it. Um, he's a brilliant uh, uh, ophthalmologist. And he decided the people in Nepal live way, way high in the mountains where the atmosphere doesn't stop the ultraviolet radiation. And he said, we can't allow people to be blind, but they can't afford a multi-thousand dollar operation. He developed a $7 lens that goes into the eye and an $18 operation. So for $25, he's cured 100,000 people, and all the G100 members are rising behind him to help raise money to build a business so he could get to millions of people. This is the kind of thing that we do. So we have seven more minutes left. What's going to be the most important commodity of the future? Food. And we have to look upon food differently. 42% of the total agricultural landmass of this planet is dedicated to feeding animals that we kill and eat. One pound of steak, I think, is 5,000 gallons of water. Then if you think about the fact that these animals produce methane, which is 25 times the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide. It has a shorter life, but it's 25 times. And then the solid waste and the liquid waste. 
and the fact that we could return that land to becoming an absorber of carbon dioxide and help the earth breathe. So there are a lot of manufactured plant foods that are coming on the market. Very, very important. But as we looked at 2050, we lose 40% of all the produce and it doesn't have the nutritional value because you have to go from the farm to the store. There's vertical farming coming in. There's brilliant technology. You go to the web and find it. And the idea is when you walk into a big box store in Canada or in America, the first thing you see is the produce. <laughs> That's the most important. So I envision by 2050, inside of these cities, we're going to have a vertical farm right next to the store, and you could literally decide what to do, and people will be able to grow it themselves. But most importantly for the cities, 2% of the area, 67% of the people, we got to go into the third dimension. You can, Toronto is a, I love Toronto, but it's a disaster with the traffic because we're living in two dimensions, and cities were designed hundreds of years ago to handle, a hundred years ago to handle automobiles. I think one of the major U.S. cities, 60% of its downtown space is devoted to roads and parking spaces. What if I go into the third dimension with air taxis? And what if I powered the air taxis with hydrogen? And I use solar cells to get the hydrogen. There are companies coming out now saying they could produce hydrogen for four to seven dollars a gallon, and they'll be ultimately able to get it to two. So it'll be cheaper than gasoline, it's twice the density of gasoline, it is 200 times the density of lithium ion batteries, which are poison when they're born and poison when you destroy them. So all of a sudden, we're going to go into the third dimension. Now we've changed everything, and people could have a life. When my daughters were growing up, I was an hour and 15 minutes away from where we lived, so I couldn't go to the school. I couldn't participate in social events. Our families were separated, and now it's even worse where people live in these big cities, and as they change jobs, husband and wife are separated. So I have an expression. Air mobility plus hydrogen equals more sex. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan, let me ask you, in this process that you're describing of, of major transformation and transition, uh, whom should we trust in the process? People don't, don't trust governments anymore, right? Governments went from being this parental institution to an institution being viewed with suspicion. People don't trust the big multinational corporations. Whom should we trust? Well, let me throw it back and say, don't trust the crap you see on social networks. Become educated. And when you go to vote, make sure that the issues of the future of our society is really important. The earth is dying. The glaciers are melting at an unprecedented rate. The oceans are heating up. Uh, all sorts of bad things could happen. Yet, we continue to consume fossil fuel. I'm not going against the fossil fuel industry. I'm saying you must be a responsible citizen. To hell with this stuff where you say you could blame somebody else. Your vote counts, and the reason that we have what we have is everyone complains and doesn't participate in the election process and doesn't vote on issues that will affect the life of their children and their grandchildren, and because they're going to live longer themselves. Before we end, give us one or two reasons to be optimistic about the future. Humans are basically good. They're a little mixed up right now. <laughs> they have too many things coming at them. But at their core, they've always responded in a positive manner. In my case, I spent a quarter of a century of my life working to take down the Soviet Union. It was intense. When the Cold War ended, I was very, very proud of what I had accomplished with a, a, a number of other human beings. And the Cold War ended on 
December 31st, 1991, April 1st of 1992, I was sworn in as the NASA Administrator by President George H.W. Bush, and he said, Dan, we can't allow the Russian economy to collapse or the Russians to lose pride in themselves. I know what you did. Bring the Russians into the International Space Station so that they would focus on the civil aspects of space, and we won't do what we did at Versailles. <laughs> we will be positive. It was very stressful for me and a lot of the astronauts, but the fact of the matter is it's going to be up there next October for 20 years, not one problem, and even though there's stress between the United States and Europe, uh, and Russia, everything works on the station. So on a personal level, and I think on a human level, everyone could do it. So goodwill is the key to a successful. Thank you so much, Dan. I think you can see by, by the enthusiastic, I can see by the, the enthusiastic response of the audience that they also appreciate, like I do, this opportunity to be educated by you, to learn from you, and to be inspired by you. Thank you so much, Dan. An honor. Thank you.